All right, I think we're gonna get started. Thank you for everyone for joining us today. Uh, we may be starting a little later than some of you expected, but we're glad you're here. Uh, my name is Kimberly King and I'm the Industry Relations Manager for DBSA National. I am so pleased to be here today with my esteemed colleagues from the Star Coalition. Um, I have with us today, Carol Whit Dr. Carol Whitman, who is the board chair of Star Coalition, Adam Sims, who is the clinical program management director for Alchemies, and Aaron Tyerman, Dr. Aaron Tyerman, who is the director of business and clinical development for Siegel Trials. And we're here today to help you learn a little bit more about ways that peers can support mental health research efforts, as well as to talk about the impact of mental health research on mental wellness. As many of you may already know, the STAR Coalition is a nonprofit organization that serves as a forum for leaders in mental health, mental health clinical research, advocacy, treatment, and peers working together to create a better system of care. DBSA National is part of a work group composed of mental health stakeholders, including clinical investigators, pharmaceutical and site research on development executives, and advocacy leaders that have developed a call search with concrete action people can take immediately. The goal of today's session is we're gonna cover three key areas. One is why is peer engagement important to mental health research? Two, what are the obstacles and challenges that peers face when involved with mental health research? And three, what actions can peers take to support mental health research efforts? Before uh, we begin hearing from our panelists, I have a few housekeeping reminders. During the session, you're welcome to put your questions in the Q&A box, and we will attempt to answer as many questions at the end of each presentation and, and save some time at the end for um, questions if time permits. So without further ado, I'm happy to um, introduce Carol Whitman, who's gonna to talk to you a little bit more about the history of the STAR Coalition and its efforts, to, uh, its current efforts to create a call of action with regards to mental health research. The screen is yours, Carol. Thanks, Kimberly. And um, yeah, thanks for inviting us. Um, thanks for being such a great advocate and um, your beautiful smile always makes the world a better place. And thanks for letting us be a part of this. Um, I'm Carol Whitham and I'm part of the STAR Coalition. I just wanna say in all transparency, I'm not very technology savvy. So if my screen goes blank, it's me. And um, I'm also not the greatest speaker, um, but I hope my passion overpowers my words um, because this is a topic that I'm extremely passionate about. So without further ado, let me, um, you know, I've been charged to talk a little bit about the STAR Coalition, and it, it really stands for Stakeholders in Treatment, Advocacy, Research, and Recovery. It's really a holistic approach of ways that we can better serve um, individuals and families living with a mental illness. And so... You know, the evolution of how these conversations occurred, it was really a small work group of some advocates, some researchers, um, some friends of mine in the industry as provider, um, just talking about ways that we can provide more access to individuals um, um, uh, th throughout the, the treatment regime and providing um, and viewing research as, a, as an option. And so it's something that was a really small group. People wanted to get involved. So that's how the STAR Coalition um, came about with all transparency of how it evolved, how it was financially funded, et cetera. So the idea um, originated about six years ago um, where Kimberly was saying it was it's a 501c3. And we wanted to just in, in general, um, as an ecosystem of healthcare providers, wanted to make a change in the system. And the intent of the STAR was really a conduit of, to be a conduit of all stakeholders in a really safe place that people can be honest um, with issues that are occurring in the in, in um, healthcare, um, and wanted it to be unbranded or there was broader conversations. So the mission of the STAR is to create meaningful change by increasing communication partnerships and goodwill among stakeholders in the areas of mental health treatment, advocacy and clinical research, 
with obviously the emphasis on community and advocacy engagement, stigma reduction, and ensuring that clinical research is recognized as a trusted care option. Obviously, we were very, very uh, um, excited about this mission six years ago. We're starting to uh, evolve and make it a little bit uh, more streamlined, but that's uh, a pretty um, um, a, 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 a a mission that's been um, dear to our hearts from the very beginning. So people may say, "Why did how did DBSA and how did how do we get involved?" And um, the very first person that we connected with within the advocacy groups with DBSA was Louie Godnick. And hopefully, many of you guys on this call have, have had the pleasure um, of meeting him or knowing him. But he was a fierce supporter of the Star Coalition and loved to spend really hours and hours and hours talking about ways that we could make a difference in people's lives um, living with, with depression and bipolar. Unfortunately, we lost Lou about five years ago. And offline, I can tell you all kinds of amazing stories about this human being um, um, that I don't want to take 45 minutes discussing. <laughs> on the, the, I'll probably get in trouble. So, um, the coalition members really wanted to honor him, and they created the Louie Godnick Award, um, which I think the DBSA community should be really proud of because um, uh, the, the members are made up of many different groups. They recognized his leadership. Um, and the award is for um, those who um, challenge conventional wisdom, you know, find creative ways to make real positive change, and they're fearless in their pursuit for justice and advocacy. Um, so in his honor, we'll go to the next thing, things that we talked about with advocacy, um, different, um, advocacy groups coming in. A lot of them would say, well, what is the Star Coalition? What, what's our role in it? And, you know, really the role of advocacy is to really focus on protecting individual rights and their choices. And that includes clinical trials. Um, to recognize that the heart of our work is, is positive change through collaboration. We can't do things in silos anymore. And placing your passion and resources into changing the systems of care, increasing access for patients um, or individuals um, needing treatment or treatment options. Um, share the mission. Share the mission of the STAR with other advocates. And, you know, at the end of the day, individuals and their families living with mental illness deserve that from every single one of us. So one of the things that we talked about with, um, you know, clinical trials is, um, you know, the bias and not looking at it as a treatment option. And I wanted to share a story with you um, that I think is a little interesting that um, I experienced early on when we created the STAR. And it's really the question is, um, you know, do your own biases limit options and perpetuate stigma with individuals around you um, that you make it serve or advocate for? So, Kimberly, do you mind sharing this video? Thank you. So I don't believe you guys can hear the sound, but you can see these motions. So keep watching. <laughs> so if you go to the next slide, I, I would love to be able to see everybody's face that's on this um, video, but wanted to really kind of know what you think. So in the question and answer box, you can definitely. That is um, Miss Miller. Um, she does laughing yoga and she was doing a session when we start, first started the star. And I had an individual across the desk for me as I was watching this video and there's She's laughing and carrying on um, throughout the whole uh, session. And the whole time I was like, this is, I, I don't even know what to think about this. And this is not funny. And this is, this is ridiculous. And I had someone across the, the uh, desk from me saying, almost mimicking everything I said, because she trusted me and she 
I valued my opinion. The problem with that is I realized right then that I, in my own words, had limited options for her. You know, that potentially could have been a really good option for her is laughing yoga. And um, so I did a little experiment. I, I felt horrible. I talked to her about it. And then I showed it to 60 of um, 60 individuals in my day treatment program. And um, I put it up on the screen. 40 of them started laughing hysterically and thought it was the best thing that I'd ever showed them. And by the way, we use laughing yoga in a my day treatment setting as of, you know, still today. 20 individuals either walked out or they, they thought I was silly to even show them that video. But, you know, all in all, even if it made a difference in one person's life, it made one person laugh. Who, who am I to limit anyone's options like that? So Tina Miller actually is, um, has received many, many awards, and she received the Voice of Hope by the American Cancer Society. So the oncology community um, recognized that as a potential treatment option. And then why of somebody that has advocated her, you know, my whole career for individuals living with a mental illness, why would I limit it? And I, so I'm, I, I pose the question to you guys, um, do you have any potential biases that may impact someone else's recovery? And so it's when we project our own bias that we hinder other people's treatment options. And that's something that, to think about as we uh, proceed. And, and Adam and Aaron will kind of share a little bit about those options. Um, and I think at the heart of everything we do, um, no matter what you are, an advocate, a researcher, a, um, you know, you, you sell medications, you're a dietitian that gives that as an option for recovery, um, et cetera, et cetera, on and on. If we keep in the golden threads to the epicenter of the person that's living with the illness and their families, we will get somewhere in CNS disorders. And so a lot of people will say, what's your why, Carol? And so my next slide is my why. This is Lonnie. I love him. He loves me. Um, and it's not about if he, he's living with an illness. He's a human being that deserves my advocacy. So, Kimberly, I'll take it back to you. Thanks, Carol. We're going to go to the Q&A box and see if we have any questions. Seeing none, I guess I'll get started. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, a little bit about my role with the Star Coalition, and talk about um, the role of peers in mental health research from my perspective as an advocate, a mental health advocate, and a professional with DBSA. So um, I'm going to talk first about some of the ways that sorry, some of the ways that um, mental health research and the prevalence of mental health illnesses impact mental wellness. So th this is what we know. Despite the greater prevalence of mental illnesses, the investment in research for new treatment options is often lower than research for other disease areas such as oncology and HIV and AIDS. Untreated medical illness costs um, the society or the world over $300 billion each year. One in five adults in the U.S. experience mental um, illness or serious mental health disorders. Percentage of youth ages 16 to, I'm sorry, six to 17 are experiencing mental health disorders at a higher rate than ever before. The average delay between symptom onset and treatment is 11 years. That's a really long time to get a diagnosis, much less find a treatment that will meet your needs. And as it relates to the medical product and development and research side, which I've learned a lot about in my time with DBSA and working with our wonderful um, industry partners like Alchemies and many others, um, we also, I also have learned a lot about why this is, impacts or how this impacts medical product development. 
So we, we know that patient recruitment is often cited as the leading challenge for conducting research, particularly as it pertains to the clinical study of mental health. Studies show that the proportion of people living with a mood disorder who participate in clinical research is smaller than those who live with a physical disorder, and that people living with a mental health condition are less willing to volunteer for research studies than those with physical disorders. And a lot of the reason for that is because they're simply, they may lack the education or knowledge of where those trials are and the value they have um, for themselves or their loved ones. Those living with uh, also findings in mental health research studies also indicate that clinician bias, as Carol mentioned earlier, may negatively impact patient recruitment because the theory is that if the doctor or the clinician doesn't think the person is a suitable candidate, even if they may be just that, then they won't mention a trial or, re or research study to them, which leads to bias and leads to the right pe the people that need to get in those type of studies not being able to get access to them. So like I said, over the last three years, I've worked um, alongside, and had the pleasure of working alongside uh, many committed mental health product developers, many research partners to help raise awareness about the vital need for new and better treatment options. For them, has been the opportunity to see firsthand that how our industry partners, how committed they are to patient care and their willingness to learn about the patient or peer journey and incorporate that learning into their work. The opportunity here to represent DBSA and to serve as a member of the STAR Coalition has really helped deepen my knowledge and my passion about the importance of mental health research and the role that this uh, plays in saving lives and improving the quality of life for people who live with mental health conditions like depression and bipolar disorder. So as it relates to the call to action which the STAR Coalition um, put together about two years ago now, Everything's such a blur, but I think it was two years ago, pre-COVID times. Uh, I want to share with you about a few ways that peers and, or care partners can support this um, initiative. One of the things we found out in the development of the call to action, because we were trying to reach multiple stakeholders, we realized every message wasn't aligned with every audience that we were trying to reach. And there was a very specific call for um, peers or potential participants for these trials. And uh, we want, I wanted to make sure that by having a uh, broadcast of stakeholders here and that we covered all, all the ways that we can get involved from our different areas. At DBSA, we believe that everyone has a right to choose their own path of wellness. And while DBSA does not endorse or recommend any particular treatment option or study, nor would we ever suggest that participating in a clinical trial or study is right for everyone, we do recognize the importance and the impact that this work has on the treatment and lives of the people in our community. So here are some of the ways that you can get involved. And surprisingly enough, it does not start with actually volunteering for, for a trial or study, although that is definitely an option that we'll talk about a little bit later. So, and much, very much at the heart of what DBSA does, it's about sharing your story of success or overcoming your mental health illness with the proper treatment. Wherever you are sharing your story with friends or a more public platform, such as working with our um, community engagement community by Andrew Smith and on uh, mental health matters and such, um, or if you are offering encouraging support to others who are participating, the story of your success journey with research helps bring awareness to research and sharing your story also helps promote understanding and empathy for those without living without mental um, health disorders. Contribute your knowledge, your, contribute to medical knowledge. Now, you might be saying, as a peer caregiver, how can I contribute to medical knowledge? I'm not a clinician. Well, the peer voice is valuable. And at DBSA, we definitely believe in the power of amplifying the peer voice. So there's many ways to support mental health research beyond actually participating. You can respond to surveys, participate in one of DBSA's peer, um, peer councils, where we oftentimes partner with um, our industry partners to um, get insights on um, re uh, patient recruitment tools, um, information that's being distributed, 
um, fancy and often scary things known as informed consent, which Adam can talk and Aaron can talk a little bit more about and things of that nature. So, and you also have opportunity to participate in by sharing information about your genetic um, background with um, databases like 23andMe that uses data from this, uh, medical research. Another way that you can um, support mental health research is to learn about some of the healthcare reform bills introduced in Congress specific to mental health policies. Supporting policy, Supporting policy, advocating for mental health research raises public policy awareness about the importance of mental health, both federally funded research and research conducted by private sectors. It means advocating for policies that promote a robust research enterprise in the United States. Such policies include, but not limited to, funding for federal agencies such as National Institutes of Health, which is the largest public funder of medical research in the world. Another way is to become an advocate in your state to push mental health up the public agenda and change government policy for the better. Some of you may be very familiar with our calls to action uh, led by our advocacy team and making you aware of uh, activities in your area and ways you be involved. So we encourage you to, to write, to call, to visit your congressional office and them to make mental health research a higher on DBSA website or the Star Coalition and many other uh, stakeholder sites about um, different policies that um, affect mental health research. And I apologize because I'm getting this annoying message that says my internet is unstable, but hopefully I'll um, be on long enough to finish what I'm saying here. Um, you also come um, sign petitions to advocate for mental health research funding and support. As part of the call, national call to action that the Star Coalition put together, um, there are two pe uh, petitions available. I believe they're still listed on the website, um, or you can find them on change.org, related to an increase in funding for mental health research and it's a petition to support the national promotion of mental health clinical trials. And then last but certainly not least is to volunteer for research. Volunteering for clinical research offers a host of benefits to the volunteer and increases the data and ensures a higher rate of success, which supports further research. And you might say, how do I find out about um, trials and studies in my era? Start by talking to your provider um, about the availability of, of research trials. Simply ask, do you know any research that I could participate in? Many providers, who, are, who treat illness are not aware of research in the community because their patients don't ask. Asking your providers the next, at your next visit may encourage them to be more proactive and learn more and share that information with you and others. We also encourage you to search on websites like www.clinicaltrials.gov, which lists the clinical research trials in your area. You also can find some of these uh, information, similar trials on DBSA's website. And, and other um, so, um, stakeholder entities. Uh, you also can contact the clinical research site in your area. So you can contact a friendly face like Aaron uh, to learn more about ways you connect to clinical research sites. Even if you don't, um, even they don't have an active study, you can, um, you can qualify the time. Just collecting your information can leave it a uh, possibility open for you to participate in future studies. So I'm gonna pause there because I probably said a lot and there's a question <laughs> here in the chat box. Yay, that means somebody's listening. So I have Bill Chestnut here and he's asking, <laughs> are the slides available um, for later? We'll only see the PowerPoint page. Yes, um, our section we, um, of the panelists with the exception of Carol because she, this, she is the chair and founder are just basically letting you know who's talking to you at this time. But if you would like more information or you would like a, a written copy of on the transcript that I'm speaking of, I can, I'm happy to share that with you. So without further ado, let me see. Do I have any more questions? No. So I'm gonna go to Adam and you're gonna get one of those annoying placeholder um, <laughs> slides. But Air, Air, Adam is a wonderful person and he's gonna present you with some great information. I'm sure I'll be happy to share, share the script a little bit later on. Great, thank, 
Thank you so much, Kimberly. Um, and thank you so much for inviting me to be here today. It's, it's really an honor and a pleasure to be here um, I'm speaking with the DBSA Leadership Summit. Um, I know that if you are looking at the slide, it says the role of industry and in mental health research. Um, you know, I, I do research. I'm a researcher for a pharmaceutical company now. Um, before I worked at Alchemy, as I used to work in academia at Boston Children's Hospital and Emory. And, and I'm going to speak kind of more broadly about, you know, the role of, you know, why it's important for researchers to have um, peers active in, in uh, mental health research in particular to this topic, but, you know, in, in research in general. Um, and, and hopefully you'll leave here with kind of, uh, you know, why it's important for, you know, peers um, broadly to, to participate and, and be involved. And I'll start with, you know, kind of, you know, where, decisions are made about to do actually do research. Let's let's start there. Um, there's typically two things that need to be answered. If you're going to test out a new medicine, if you're going to test out a new therapy, a new technology, you're going to test out the effectiveness of laughing yoga. And that's, you know, one, do you have some type of scientific or biological rationale? And that, you know, can be done in experiments in the lab. It can be from some data that's generated from previous studies in academia or from the NIH, or it could even be a data point like Carol just shared with me that in a little survey that it appears that 40 out of 60 per, per, you know people actually like laughing yoga well that's a data point that suggests there might be some type of scientific rationale that we might want to explore this a little bit further the second component of it and Kimberly, you brought this up, you know, as a very important part for researchers is these peer councils and that's answering the question of is there an unmet need and uh, you might be thinking, you know, uh, of course, you know, the, there's been unmet needs for, our, for a long time here, but again, putting together that biological scientific rationale, you know, we could identify something in the lab that impacts the brain that makes Coke taste more like Pepsi. And that could be very interesting scientifically. But if we go and we ask if the, there's an unmet need, you say, well, no, you could just buy Pepsi or Coke's much better tasting in the first place. Why would anybody want that? You know, that's, that's obviously an extreme example, but a lot of times that historically research, and particularly mental health research, is, I, in my opinion, missed the mark, is that we're asking the wrong questions. The question might not necessarily be, does this medication that's slightly different than something already approved do the same thing? The real question might be, you know, does this medication in combination with laughing yoga, you know, work a little bit better? Or who is this medication going to be best suited for? Or with, is it this medication for this group of people with this type of technology that have this type of, of genetic background? So really making sure that we're asking the right questions um, is, is really key to making sure that we're researchers are doing good research and having peers involved in that process about making sure that we're on target with what our research questions are is incredibly important. So let's say that we've identified a good hypothesis and we've identified there's an unmet need. Now, how does research happen? And this is where we really need the help. Um, you know, Kimberly had mentioned before, you know, research can't happen in a vacuum. Um, you know, I'll, I'll go through some of those examples. So, you know, the volunteerism, for example, again, you know, clinical trials of medicines, not for everybody, but there are ways for people to participate and volunteer. It can be in some of those focus groups, making sure we're asking the right questions. It can be, you know, working on imaging, uh, imaging studies or, um, you know, donating genetic samples so that we can get a little bit better idea about, you know, what type of genotypes might be more responsive. Certainly involvement in clinical trials is incredibly important. Um, you know, part of the reason that drug development and becomes much more expensive is because clinical trials take a long time to run and unfortunately fail a lot of times just because they don't meet their enrollment targets. So having people involved, um, certainly making them go faster and being much more efficient um, helps out with once you've got good uh, research question, actually making sure that you're able to get the answer to those research questions. Um, the promotion component of it. This is really kind of the um, another area where I think that DBSA and individual peers can help out a whole lot. Um, you know, uh, we have 
often ask the question, how can we get more people to participate? And, and when we talk to peers and, and when we talk to people who have participated in research, the answer is always very consistent. They don't want to hear from their doctor. They don't want to hear from you know a, a newspaper article or any a website they want to talk to their friends and their family members their peers other people living in similar situations so you know it's it's the bad restaurant review if somebody goes and they don't know anything about research and they just say oh that's extreme i wouldn't do that well that person's not likely to to participate or even inquire about research you know or if you could say well, I've never done it, but here are some areas that you could get a little more information. Or if you have participated in it, and Aaron can speak about this, you know, for kind of as working at a site that, that has an opportunity to see people participate in research all the time. If those people can share their message about what research meant to them, why they participated in it, that's going to help out a lot with the promotion of getting more people involved. Um, Certainly funding, you know, uh, Kimberly brought this up, you know, if we look at the funding of mental health research in comparison, and, and obviously very important other areas of funding for the NIH and in cancer and in other devastating diseases, but mental health research certainly lags behind a lot of other disease areas. There's very uh, much less um, also private foundation funding that happens for mental health research than if you think about things like the Fox Foundation that you know funds Parkinson's or the number of different cancer uh, research groups that you can donate money to. They are out there. The Star Coalition has on our call to action, you know, some examples in there and DBSA being one um, that's very supportive of research. Um, so we encourage, you know, pharmaceutical companies can, can fund some of the medicine research we do. We also fund other research that has nothing to do with with medicines that we have but um, this is something that you know through individuals funding as well as when you're speaking to policymakers and everything ask them to you know uh, you know make sure that the NIH is is giving equal priorities to, to mental health research um, and the final component of it this this policy component you know uh, Kimberly spoke a little bit about this I know that DBSA a couple of years ago focus uh, uh, participated in a uh, patient-focused drug development uh, meeting with the FDA. These are incredibly important. They're a very good first step for getting the conversation started because even if there's an unmet need, even if there's good supporting scientific evidence, there's still regulators that need to help dictate um, what's going to get approved and ultimately what's going to be covered by you know, providers and insurance. And you know, continuing to advocate for these are endpoints that are of interest to me. This is what is going to make a difference in, in my life um, with the FDA. Um, and, 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 and so if we're involved in, in this process together from let's ask a good question, we think that we've got something here to now that we've answered the question that's important to us, making sure that regulators um, you know, and, and, and everybody's on board with this, this makes sense in these instances for uh, this new therapy to be approved, hopefully together, and, and obviously we're, we're talking about this very high level, we together can get new therapies approved faster, more efficiently, um, and, 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 and I think that's a common goal that hopefully everybody here at this meeting have. Um, so I'm, I'm going to pause there just because that's kind of, you know, the broad altruistic why we all need to work together to get new therapies and, and how it is that I think that we can, um, you know, make this the system much more efficient um, and, and be much uh, more efficient in, in getting new therapies out to peers. Um, but I, I do want to let Aaron speak a little bit of kind of the, uh, well, what's in it for me? What's in it for the individual? Because there's also in addition to these broad ideas of, of having new treatments and new therapies available, I think that there's a lot of, you know, benefits for individuals. And so, um, you know, with that, I'll let Aaron speak about it a little bit more from, from somebody that works at a research site. Thank you, Adam. Um, so I'm Erin Tyerman. I work at Siegel Trials, which is a site network in South Florida. And we primarily focus in mental health research. Um, we have some other areas of focus, but our primary focus really is mental health research. And so I'm gonna discuss a little bit about what's in it for you and as a participant and kind of why at Siegel Trials, we think that our relationships 
with advocacy groups is so important and how that all comes together to kind of um, support this call to action. So um, as a participant, you one thing that we really um, like to explain is that research can be a care option for, for people. Um, we can't say that it's a treatment option because in many cases there is the option or the potential receiving what's called a placebo, which is no medication. However, um, at our sites, particularly in mental health research, you have a usually a board eligible or board certified psychiatrist who is the principal investigator on these trials. Um, you have sub investigators who are physicians of some sort or physician extenders, such as nurse practitioners or physician assistants who are trained um, in working with mental health and um, individuals with mental health indications. Um, additionally, part of mental health trials involve what's called rating scales. And um, those are just assessments that you are asked a lot of questions um, about how you've been feeling over the past week or over the past X amount of days. And those are usually conducted by somebody who has a master's or a doctorate in psychology. And so you, when you come on site and you decide to participate in a clinical research trial, not only are you receiving care by a psychiatrist or another physician, you're also seeing a psychologist regularly. It's not therapy by any means, we're not doing therapy, but you are meeting with these individuals who are checking on your health, they're checking on your wellness, um, you receive labs, ECGs, um, you know, blood work, all free of, charge. Um, it's, it costs nothing to participate in a clinical trial. It is completely voluntary. If you go, you participate, you get to visit three and you just don't want to do this anymore. It is a hundred percent. Okay. To say, you know what, this isn't for me. I don't want to do it. And you can withdraw your consent to do so. Um, you, what we like to be able to do though, is provide that care option. So you don't have to have insurance either. So if you don't have insurance, you don't have a way to see a physician on a regular basis, clinical research can be an option for you. You can come in, you can meet with a handful of professionals and receive a bunch of standard of care uh, procedures all at no cost. Um, well, Siegel Trials has been involved with the SAR Coalition, I think pretty much since the inception, um, actually, uh, tying back to DBSA, Lou uh, actually came and, and visited with myself and the president of my company uh, very at the very beginning of the Star Coalition, and we had a really great conversation. And um, he was a phenomenal man. And like Carol said, we we're not going to talk about him for forty five minutes, but um, he really it was such a pleasure to have him come and and discuss research and why he thinks research is important and. Um, we work with a lot of our local advocacy groups. We are pretty lucky in that capacity. Um, and what I like to explain to everybody is we don't use our relationships with the advocacy groups as a recruitment tool by any means. Um, we're not trying to make a relationship with you because we want you to just send us a bunch of patients to participate in our trials. Um, we like to educate the groups on what research is, why it is important. Um, we don't have the one magic pill or magic medication that solves every instance of depression or every instance of anxiety or schizophrenia or any other diagnosis. If we did, we wouldn't be continuing to do research. We have some really good medications and a lot of those have some pretty bad side effects. So, you know, the purpose of, of what we're doing is to really continue to explore different options that can help alleviate maybe even some of that so side effects. You can have a medication that works phenomenal on certain symptoms, but causes really bad side effects. And then we continue to research and see if there's a way to counteract those and have that same effect of the medication. And um, that's really uh, why we are so passionate about what we do. Um, I have a lot of stories about why I'm, I'm passionate about uh, research and, and being able to provide that care option to individuals. Most recently we had, um, I'll tell you a little story. We had somebody who was participating in an inpatient clinical trial with us and he had been in our facility for about a month. Um, this was over the summer and he had, he had 
discharge the facility because um, you can do inpatient studies where you stay in our facility for X number of days, or you can do outpatient where you come once a week or once every two weeks. There's different um, phases and different you know ways of participating in a trial. For this particular instance, he um, he participated and he was inpatient in our facility for about a month, um, and we really got to know him well. Um, he was someone who had schizophrenia, and um, it was it was pretty it was pretty bad. He was pretty delusional. Um, he had very fixed delusions. And um, after he left us, uh, about three weeks later, we were watching the news, and um, unfortunately, he was killed by police officers. Um, and it was because he was in a very clear mental health crisis. Um, he had a pocket knife that was probably about this big and he had been cutting himself and he was in a parking lot and he was holding this knife and the police in our city decided that the best way to deal with this threat was to shoot him seven times in the chest. Um, immediately that, I, you know, I was actually with a group of my colleagues at the time when we actually got the news and all of us just kind of went silent because it, to us, it was just very obvious that he was in crisis and didn't need to get shot seven times in the chest. But one of the reasons that we really try to partner with our advocacy groups is to be able to go out into the community and have conversations with our police officers, with other community members about how we can work together to educate and understand that someone who's cutting himself with a knife that's maybe this big is probably not a threat to you to the point where you need to pull your guns. Um, and additionally, we would we like to be able to give our volunteers options to go out when they leave us or when they're finished with the trial, advocacy groups to go to, peer support groups to be able to work with. And so that's the site um, connection with, with advocacy and especially our site. And I know Carol's site as well. Um, it's it, the purpose is not so, Hey, I need 20 people to enroll into my study right now. This really is to just educate that we are here. We can be a care option. We can provide you some blood work, some ECGs. You get compensated for your time and travel. So you come and you might get $50 for the week um, for the visit or X number of dollars to participate. Um, and we do it because we care. Um, you know, it's 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 not just a, a money making thing. Everybody, I can say that that one of the major things within our company is really for staff retention is the fact that we are involved so heavily in the community and we do care so much about what we do and who we provide services to. And so as sites, in terms of the call to action, we really try to just promote research as much as possible. We really try to make these advocacy relationships. Um, we find them incredibly important. We try and participate in as many things as possible. Um, if anybody from the DBSA South Florida happens to be on here, I would love to meet you <laughs> because unfortunately after Lou, we kind of fell off. Um, and we would love to make that relationship um, and be able to see if there's any sort of collaboration we could do just to be able to provide our volunteers those services as well. Um, so that's that's my perspective. <laughs> Thank you so much, Aaron, Adam, and Carol for sharing um, your time to share your insights. Um, as I said before, um, it's really a pleasure for me to to be a member of the Star Coalition and learn so much and get different perspectives. And we sometimes have friendly debates, but we always come back as friends and have a deeper understanding of what the needs are for people who live with mood disorders and how each of us from our different um, um, parts of the, of, the spe of the ecosystem can be effective in trying to um, move forward change. So I'm gonna look really quickly here to see if we have any additional questions. Uh, I don't see here, but I do have a question kind of the group. I'm just gonna ask a very general question if we wanna just go down the line, starting with Adam to um, 
just kind of, is there anything that you would like the audience to know that that's something that we didn't cover, maybe something in the realm of what is your deepest wish to see moving forward with this initiative? Well, I, I alluded to it before, um, you know, about research being incredibly inefficient. And um, I think there's a number of different causes for it. And, and again, asking the wrong questions, not designing the right studies, not getting people to participate, you know, and, and you know, there's pharmaceutical companies historically have done themselves a disservice. I'll, I'll be the first person to admit that in that um, often our seen it's, it's the one thing that in our very polarized country right now is that everybody can agree is drugs cost too much money. And I'll be the first person to put my hand up and say, I absolutely agree. And, you know, to point to just say, well, it costs a whole lot to, to make new medicines or to come up with new therapies or new technologies or for hospitals to implement or to clinics. To, that's lazy. It doesn't need to be that way. Um, and uh, so I think that by getting more people involved in the process to make sure we're asking the right questions to developing them when these things, it, it shouldn't be that hard to do it. And if it's not that hard and it, it shouldn't be that expensive, then that has to trickle down on everything. So, um, you know, I, I'll echo what Aaron said, you know, the, the people that I work with, the researchers, the scientists that are, they all have their own stories. They're all very passionate. There are a lot of people working long hours and everything like that coming up, but we can't do it alone. And if we do do it alone, we're, we're not going to be any more efficient than how we have been. So, um, we, you know, we, we need your help and hopefully we can work together, um, to, to, you know, solve a lot of these problems. Thank you, Adam. Aaron and Carol, I want to give you a chance to um, talk in about two minutes we have left. Um, my biggest hope is just to get rid of the stigma around mental illness in general and um, research in mental health. Um, everyone's real quick to jump into a diabetes trial or a cancer clinical trial, and it should be just the same for mental health. There should be no stigma. Thank you, Aaron. Carol? Here, I'm here. I told you I was not technology savvy. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think because I'm a provider and I work with a lot of not only um, individuals that go into research, but also individuals that would never qualify for a trial, maybe they're too ill and it just wouldn't be safe for them to participate, um, that, um, you know, we're all in it for them, um, for individuals um, who need it the most. And also, I think my biggest passion is to, to, to provide more access to individuals, especially in the environment that we're in. Across this country, individuals are struggling with getting in to see their doctors, getting into, especially if they're on Medicaid, Medicare, um, and seeing therapists, et cetera. So just continuing to have these conversations with a lot of different stakeholders that we get access to. Um, more threads to treatment options. So that's great, Carol. And I just really quickly add, I just would like to see as a whole mental health be treat uh, and individuals who live with mental uh, mood disorders be seen as a whole person beyond their illness. And that when people are looking at mental health research, it's not just research of um, something that one can't see, but it's part of health. And there's to put the same focus and effort that we do in other disease states on mental health. Well, thank you everyone. I encourage you to visit the star, www.thestar.org to learn more about the Star Coalition and all the great work they're doing. You can also visit the DBSA website about ways to get involved or sign up for our newsletter, Making Mental Health Matter, where we talk more about advocacy efforts and opportunities to participate in peer council and under other projects of that nature. So thank you everyone for joining. Thank you to all our panelists and have a great evening.